afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everybody. Uh, we will continue our work workshop with a lecture uh, on reactor physics of innovative nuclear energy systems. That will be delivered by Professor Vladimir Tisuk, who is now working as a counselor and advisor to Director General of State Atomic Energy Corporation, Rosatom. Vladimir received his PhD from Oblinsk Institute for Nuclear Engineering in 1991. So, Vladimir, you have your mates here from the same university. And he also got the Doctor of Engineering from Tokyo Institute of Technology in 1997. We also have a colleague from Tokodai here. She mm -hmm. was graduated from Tokodai mm -hmm. as well. And uh, he was working in the field of nuclear engineering so, so for many years, and uh, in particular in Tokyo Institute of Technology and INP before he became an advisor to the Director General of the Rosatom. Okay, Vladimir, you have mm -hmm. 90 minutes for your presentation, including please leave some time for the questions and uh, mm -hmm. comment and discussion. And now, please start your present lecture now. So, thank you, Vladimir. So, do you hear me well? Yes, yes, That's perfect. Final, yes. final check. So first of all, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to join this very interesting event. I tell you the truth, within the last uh, day, and today I joined the meeting and was careful listener, uh, participa uh, participated in listening, just listening. And I found that you have uh, arranged very professional audience, not only uh, high level educated and the professional uh, professionals, professional professionals, but also participants from many countries. They, I, I appreciated the question, by the way. So I will not uh, give you a tutorial lecture. My lecture will be not a tutorial. I will give you some vision, which I have myself, to the reactor physics of innovative nuclear energy systems. And uh, within next slide, I will give you the just general content of my, uh, let's say, not a lecture, a presentation. First, I would like to give you global context. Why we look for innovations? And this is the important part of my presentation because on my current position as a counselor and advisor to Director General of the State Atomic Energy Corporation, I have uh, my duty to read a lot of literature and give some some impression of the reading to my bosses and to, to my colleagues. So that's why the main um, objectives of this part of my presentation is to give you a reference literature about global context, about why we are looking for innovation. As for innovation itself, I really and uh, well understand that you have already made a definition within your, your community. What does it mean, innovative nuclear energy system? Let me repeat, uh, and th that is my quotation of Vladimir. Vladimir made this definition like innovative, that is not evolutionary. Evolutionary means reactor systems with uh, water cooling. And innovative nuclear energy system is those which mm, go beyond the water technology that is uh, rooted in the 17th century, in fact, but to higher temperatures, to liquid metals, and so on. So I will live with you within this hour, exactly within this paradigm. No, that, no, that, that is innovative nuclear energy system, as I understand, and uh, I, I, I do recognize that it's in line with the organizers of this event. But what about reactor physics? By reactor physics, and that is synonym of reactor physics is neutronics. I will talk about very important uh, features of neutronics, of fast reactors, very basic ones, but those which define the policy. And uh, finish with neutronic or fusion facilities, because fusion is also innovative, it's coming. It's on agenda now. So that is the main topics I will try to cover in my uh, presentation. 
So mm -hmm. just have a look at the uh, general uh, factors affecting nuclear development. And here you can see uh, that is United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2030, adopted in 2015. Paris Agreement adopted in 2015 again. Three years later, it was a very much influential report published by International Platform on Climate Change. And this report, the cover sheet you can see on this slide. And COVID, of course, everybody, everybody were affected in this world by COVID. And uh, also European uh, Commission taxonomy that defines the number of the technologies, which so-called green technologies, uh, which can and will be uh, supported by financial institutions in the European Commission. It's also very much important factor, which opens the opportunity to innovative energy system, by the way. So there is just several factors I listed. And, uh, and uh, coming to the uh, pictures, global context. I do recognize that you have already discussed the climate change, but in order to keep up the logic of my own presentation, I also give you some illustrations and some, by the way, references. For example, in this literature, McKinsey Sustainability, Curbing Methane Emission, they have a very nice pictures of the rising global temperature, which is absolutely equidistant with the CO2 emissions. That is a fact. But if we look, uh, global greenhouse gas emission by economy sectors in the right corner of the uh, slide, you can see that the main, uh, the main portion of the emission is given by electricity and heat production. Then agriculture, industry, transport, and uh, the less is by buildings. So we all understand that uh, reactor facilities, nuclear power reactors, large scale or small, they can contribute to electricity, to industry, and even to transportation through the production of the synthetic fuel like hydrogen. What's important in this slide, most important, that is this reference. You can see here the ton of CO2 to gigawatt hour produced by um, different electricity producing technology using coal, natural gas, biomass, solar, hydropower, offshore wind, onshore wind, and you can see the least of the emission is produced by nuclear power. What important is this data is given not by nuclear community, not by International Atomic Energy Agency, not other nuclear-related agency. It is given by International Platform for Climate Change in 2014. And this International uh, Platform for Climate Change is the expert group uh, associated with the meteorology and associated with the United Nations, not from nuclear. That's important. So that is estimation of the potential of nuclear technology from outside. Please be aware about this fact. The next one, sustainable development goals. Of course, all of you aware about sustainable development goals, 17 goals adopted in 2015 uh, and declared by the previous United Nations uh, General Secretary Ban Ki-moon. Later on, several years later, it was repeated, but with a different taxon by the current United Nations General Secretary, by Mr. Guterres, who put on the agenda a little bit different uh, emphasis. That is youth 2030. Why youth? Because youth, that is just those people who will live uh, in next 20 or 30 years, not only live, but to work, to establish this world, to shape and uh, hopefully to keep peace. So that is was, uh, the reason why it is related to energy. It is 1.8 billion young people in the world today 
and 90% of them are living in developing countries, which are suffering from a lack of electricity production by the way. So energy and general global policy are very much related. And you can see there is a big caution given two years ago by international atomic, uh, no, uh, sorry, International Energy Agency Director, Dr. Fatih Birol, who mentioned in the Africa Energy Outlook, very important thing that you see that is because of global pandemic effect, because of situation in Africa, especially in Africa, the key sustainable development goals, such as increasing access to electricity and clean cooking, much harder to achieve. So that's why I entitled this slide, United Sustainable Goals from declaration to challenges. We now have a challenge to achieve this goal. And uh, of course, to anticipate a little, I will show you that nuclear power can resolve this issue. Next slide, influential factors and prognosis. You see that is uh, global nuclear electricity generation, uh, which is now about 400 gigawatt installed capacity. And you see prognosis, they are different. Net zero by 2050 report, also report from Nuclear Energy Agency, you see they almost double by 2050, double. But International Atomic Agency, those energy, which organizes this meeting, educational meeting for you, gives this kind of two lines, the maximum and minimum. And of course, it's very difficult to understand for decision-making persons which direction we have to go. Many scenarios, one of them is optimistic, one is a bit pessimistic for nuclear power. That's why it's difficult to make a decision. So for this reason, I especially, again, to make a reference to International Platform on Climate Change Report published in 2015. In several scenarios, they put on the table, these kind of numbers, nuclear power, in order to keep global warming within 1.5 degrees centigrade, should be increased almost six times. And again, let me stress, so no nuclear people were engaged in publishing and preparing this report, only meteorologists. So even compared to nuclear people, Meteorologists, which are much more aware about situation with climate change, they give a strong caution in order we survive in the future, we have to develop nuclear power technology, nuclear power electricity generation. That is the recent, uh, recent uh, World Energy Outlook 2022. It appeared just two weeks ago. And I put several uh, conclusions of this report into this slide. You can see pre-Paris baseline of uh, gigaton CO2 emissions like that. In order to keep within 1.5 degrees centigrade, we have several scenarios like stated policy scenario, that's announced pledge scenario, and net zero emission by 2050. You see three scenarios. And look at the most modest, and most humble steps, stated policy scenario. Completion of 120 gigawatt of new power capacity, nuclear capacity over this period, and another 300 gigawatt of new reactors, the equivalent of almost three quarters of the current global fleet between 2030 and 2050. And uh, the most optimistic from the viewpoint of carbon emission you can see 24 gigawatt of capacity added each year between 2022, this year, and 2050. More than doubles nuclear power capacity, more than doubles. So again, let me stress, so that is not from nuclear, that's coming from other meteorologists and energy societies. That is very influential factor for us. Now, I, as I promised, I come to the taxonomy status in 2019. This is also a very important report 
published by a group of technical experts who decided, should we include nuclear power in the taxonomy? It means, should we make a financial support for development of this technology in the future? And you see, they accept uh, this fact. Uh, evidence on the potential substantial contribution of nuclear energy to climate mitigation objectives was extensive and clear. But next point they uh, underlie, that is problematic one. Regarding the long-term management of high-level waste, there is an international consensus that a safe long-term technical solution is needed to solve the present unsustainable situation very severe words. With high level waste, we have unsustainable situation. And again, they make it more problematic. So operational disposal site for high level waste not yet exist, from which long term empirical in situ data and evidence to inform such an evaluation for nuclear energy. Problematic. So that's why technical expert group in 2019 has not recommended to include nuclear energy in the taxonomy at that stage. Problematic, well-developed country of Europe, they just dismiss nuclear power for future. So the reaction came next year. The Joint Research Center for Science for Policy uh, published a report with this title, Technical Assessment of Nuclear Energy with respect to so-called do not significant harm criteria of regulation from European Union, taxonomy regulations. Look what they are talking about. Significant research efforts has been devoted to maximizing the fraction of spent nuclear fuel that can be recycled in nuclear reactors and within this reason by circulating, reducing the long-term radiotoxicity of high-level waste to be disposed of in the geolog geological repository. Both aims are relevant to the environmental objective from the United Nations, transition to a circular economy and waste prevention and recycling. And this is the most important. Due to the fact that fast reactors allow multiple recycling of the fraction of fuel waste not consumed done, the final result of iterating this process would be an almost complete use of the fuel and increasingly reduced fraction of long lived species. So that is the focus of my presentation. You see, they pointed out fast reactors. They allow multiple recycling of unburned fuels. But later on, a little bit not so positive uh, attitude is coming. Although essentially all steps of this process, also known as partitioning and transmutation, have been demonstrated at laboratory scale, the technology readiness level is not yet corresponding to industrial maturity. So we have a gap. And that is the problem, in fact, for nuclear power development for future, how to solve the waste accumulation uh, problem. So, but this year, they issued a complementary climate delegated act. It was just in the February this year. And you see, they included nuclear related activities in the taxonomy. And please read, read from the bottom, which kind of direction of nuclear technology they included legitimately in the future development agenda. They give a permission and license for upgrades and modification of existing nuclear power plants for lifetime extension purposes, and will give license until 2040. Then new nuclear power plant project with existing technologies for energy generation of electricity or heat generation, so-called generation three plus, they will give license until 2045. And without time horizon, horizon limitation, they clearly point out research, development, and deployment of advanced technologies, generation four, that minimize waste and improve safety standards. In your community, I have witnessed that you have already discussed what does it mean generation four? 
and in Generation 4 community, the majority of the options, they are belonging to the domain of past reactors. So that's why the pre-conclusion of this first part of my presentation is, you see, future of nuclear power is fast reactor development, generation four, because of potential to resolve the waste problem. Next slide. <clears throat> For some reason, I don't know which reasons, but they didn't discuss in the taxonomy the uh, resource base for nuclear power development. So that's why I prepared special slides uh, to give you the image of the another limitation for uh, nuclear power development, not waste, but resources. Uh, I especially would like to refer to this kind of uh, publication that is Russia and world power in 21st century. Important thing, it was published in 2006. It was prepared, this textbook, and published by, uh, by a very smart, very influential uh, philosophical energy group in a leading Russian institution, Kurchatov Institute in Moscow. What they analyzed, look at this slide. That is megaton oil equivalent per capita in 1965. You see the two peaks. One peak is for well-developed countries economically, and one for developing world. And you see, uh, as time goes by, you see these two peaks becomes closer to each other. It was data for 2004. And their prognosis from 2006 for 2025, just about the recent time, at just about our moment of our lives, you see these two peaks are almost have the same metrics. What does it mean? It means the developing world, that is green line, increasing their global uh, gross uh, domestic products. And the well-developed world, northern part of the hemisphere, it's coming like that. So here they are coming in the same point. It means for their development, we have a limitation of resources, any kind of resources, any kind, any kind. Not only oil, not only coal, not only gas, any kind. Now I would like to stress uh, and put you one more focus, so-called energy substitution modeling. It is well famous modeling for energy focused activity and uh, first, I myself, I uh, learned from about this substitution modeling from nuclear technologies in a sustainable energy system published in 1986. This book is very much important, very much educative and very much informative. It is easy to find through internet this book and why I pay special attention to that. It is published by uh, International Institute for um, Applied uh, Analysis, which is located, by the way, in Vienna. Uh, and this Institute for Applied System, System Analysis, they govern the experts, energy experts or politicians. And uh, that is exactly not an institution, that is a think tank, which produces some recommendation. And uh, in the internet, I found that they give recommendation for the Roma club of people, which defines the direction of development globally. So this is so-called uh, <clears throat> Marichetti curves. You see that is time and that is technology. Wood for wood technology for, uh, for energy production, you see decreases coal, makes a peak and after that decreases, the same oil, the same gas, nuclear and some uh, and other technologies coming new one without title, uh, without entitled by Maricetti, who was the author of this course. You see, always resources, they have a peak and they have a decrease. And if we can make it safe 
and sound transition from one technology to another, from coal to oil, from oil to gas, we can avoid some geopolitical tensions. Again, this was published in 1977, and the later on, in 2007, it was again revisited by uh, Portuguese politician and economist Louis de Suasa. Uh, this is title of this book. And he analyzed the same. Only one region of this Marichetti curse was carefully, carefully revisited. That is oil crisis in 1970s. How it was affected? It was affected. But generally, curves remain like Gauss distribution. They started to increase, reach approach peaks, and then decreases. That is the point. So, and look, by the way, look, oil age is coming to the end exactly within our and next generation. Uh, the same with natural gas. And coming new technology, they put it so fast. Uh, I guess that is from solar or fusion technology. So new technology is coming, which we are now uh, shaping at the, uh, at the pre-industrial uh, case. Once again, we have a limitation of resources. Even for nuclear power, we have a resources. The same club of people, global energy assessment, in International Institute for uh, Systematic Analysis, Ten years ago, they published Global Energy Assessment. The latest data for them was 2008. And this is their prognosis to 2050. And you can see that is yellow mark, that is for nuclear. And for nuclear, you can see the growth almost six times. So well, uh, within the best uh, prognosis is given by other energy uh, nuclear energy related ag agency and even international platform for climate change. And this is their data about uranium compared to oil and gas. Look at this point. For example, conventional gas and in conventional gas, 2000 exajoules and conventional uranium, 2000. You see, comparison not in favor of nuclear power, but they have a, a reference that resource, resources and occurrences of uranium are based on a once through fuel cycle iteration, not for recycling. That is pure burning of uranium 235. And you, of course, professional, you are very much aware that the uh, a uh, fraction of the uranium-235 and natural uranium is just 0.7%. So if we continue to develop, to use nuclear power in each existing form, very soon we reach a peak pointed out by Maricetti in his uh, influential philosophic uh, book. Again, a look at the bottom of the slide. Closed fuel cycle and breeding technology would increase the uranium resources dimension, the 50 or 60 fold. And then next, thorium-based fuel cycle would enlarge the fissile resources base for further. So, but a resource limitation is not only belonging to classical nuclear technologies. So it also belongs to many other technology and not only uranium will limit the electricity production in the future. Here I summarized several uh, recent uh, data published by International Energy Agency in the uh, brochure, The Role of Critical Minerals in Clean Energy Transition. It fresh, one year ago. And look at this, the uh, upper um, portion of the slide. This is current nuclear technology. We have an image, carbon free, but large scale as mentioned by previous speakers that uh, uh, prolong the duration of the construction, make it more expensive and so on. But nevertheless, we have an image, carbon free. What about SMRs? SMRs easy to deploy, etc. And in some, in some energy policies, it is uh, considered as a complementary to renewables. 
harmonize with renewables. But uh, on agenda, and it is forward-looking technology, fusion technology, it is wasteless, wasteless. It's no high-level waste, like from fission power, but it will consume very exotic materials, which also have a limitation. Some of the minerals used in selected clean energy technologies are uh, given in this slide from the brochure I mentioned above. So you can see uh, natural gas produces minimum of this um, exotic, not exotic, but expensive materials. Coal also nuclear in the middle, but solar, wind technology, they consume four times higher than nuclear technology consumes these materials. So please do not forget that we have a limitation of the minerals, not only uranium, but other minerals. So that's why <clears throat> coming to the end of the, my uh, first part, uh, still we have on agenda the harmonizing and licensing process for emerging technologies and uh, small and um, medium sized uh, reactors SMRs and uh, integrated small modular reactors then can be deployed very quickly. And this message uh, was uh, clearly uh, published in December 2020 by OECD NAA. I specifically give the reference to the OECD NAA, not to the International Atomic Energy Agency, because International uh, Atomic Energy is, how to say, much more careful about uh, logo because of political reason. But OECD and A, that is much more professional and technical people. And they analyzed that in order to get it with the climate change objectives, we have to get small and modular reactor deployment very quickly. And it is not long-term project. We have to do this now. Now, now. That's why so much discussion about small modular reactors. But look at the quotation from proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from the United States of America. Look the title, nuclear waste from small modular reactors, and look at some conclusions. SMRs will exacerbate the challenges of nuclear waste management and disposal. We have to be aware of this fact. Not only about the fact of their conclusion, but about the fact of the existing of the community who criticize small modular reactors because of the bottleneck. And bottleneck is a typical for large scale nuclear power and for small and modular reactors. And this bottleneck is provided, unfortunately, by a nuclear waste problem. So, and now I come to the nuclear physics, to, 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 to neutronics. That is, a, that is my second part of the presentation. And I will, uh, will approach to very important um, concepts which uh, help us to understand the future of nuclear power development through the serendipitous chain of discoveries. Just to remind you, in 1900, Becquerel discovered a uh, uh, new, new natural radiation. Rutherford made the classification. And because there were no uh, words in the languages, they just put a title alphabet in there. Then they use alpha particles to bombard several materials to understand their behavior. And uh, in 2005, they discovered that some of the alpha particles from the very thin layer of gold comes back. And th that time, the only one um, uh, natural law could explain that it was a Coulomb uh, law of electricity repulsion. And with this Coulomb law, they found that within the atom, we have a nucleus, very small dimension. Proceeding with the uh, experimenting with alpha particles in 2019, they discovered a new phenomenon. You see that is in vacuum, alpha particles come to the screen and uh, without any special equipment, even with the open glasses, uh, with open eyes, you can see the flash. And when they put nitrogen gas inside the tube, they expected the stopping of alpha particles in the gas. But accidentally, they observed intensive flashes. And the only conclusion from this experiment was that uh, 
that is nuclear reaction occurred. By the way, look, from 1900 to 1919, it was 20 years past, and that is just about science. It was not a technology. So technology came, nuclear technology came with the discovery of uh, neutron, discovery of neutrons. It is attributed to uh, English uh, scientist Chadwick, who was, by the way, theoretist, who explained the situation when alpha particles strikes beryllium and produces very penetrative uh, radiation. And this penetrative radiation was not like gamma radiation discovered by uh, Henri Becquerel and Rutherford early 20 years ago. But newly discovered type of radiation is not electromagnetic wave. There is beam of neutron, not charged particles, which was uh, named uh, like a neutron. So the structure of nucleus now became clear. It is combination of protons and neutrons. So, and the reason uh, why I show you this picture is just because in Russian tradition, in the Russian textbook, we attribute the priority of the declaration of the concept of neutron proton model for nucleus uh, to Russian professor, professor of the state uh, Moscow University, Mr. Ivanenko. So <clears throat> the number of protons and neutrons, they define the type of the isotope, number of neutrons and proton that is in this corner of the mathematical formula for isotope is written. Number of protons in this corner, and this uh, determines the chemical properties, and this determines the mass of the nucleus. So with discovery of neutrons, <clears throat> humankind received an absolutely new instrument for their development, neutrons. Neutrons, they are not like charged particles. They penetrate through electric field, not repulsed back like in case of alpha particles. And so <clears throat> that was made an era of artificial isotope reduction, which was discovered by Enrico Fermi. So it, in other words, we received a philosophic stone in the Middle Age. It was a dream of the humankind to find a philosophy stone and to change one material to another. Now we received the philosophy stone, but not in, in the form of stone, in the form of neutral particle that can interact with any kind of nucleus to produce new and even artificial isotopes. And again, that was a Fermi who <clears throat> experimenting with the neutrons, uh, putting uh, near targets several light uh, layers of the materials, found that reaction probability depends on neutron energy. And the less neutron energy, the higher probability. And that came to, uh, to discover of the many things. So binding energy was uh, shown you by Adrian. So I also, just to keep up with the logic of my presentation, show the same curve that is binding energy per one uh, nucleon in the nucleus. You see for light nuclides, it is uh, rather small value. For a rather broad interval, it is within eight megawatt, uh, mega electron volt, uh, mega electron volt. And for heavy nuclides, it reduced. So for heavy nuclides, it is energetically more feasible for uh, nuclides to be efficient. And uh, the most heavy nuclides uh, naturally occurred, that is uranium. And they found that in natural uranium, uh, there are two isotopes, 235 and 238. And one of them, uranium 235, is efficient by neutrons very easily. And in the light domain of nucleus, there is another situation. For those nuclides, it is easy for them, energetically more feasible, to fuse, to combine itself. And this gave the start for technology of so-called fusion. You can see deuterium, tritium combined together, producing neutron and alpha particles. And that is the essence of the international thermal nuclear uh, energy uh, experimental reactor, which is now under construction in France with contribution of European community and a number of countries, including Japan, Russia, China, United States, Korea, and India. 
So that is technology for future, as I mentioned, forward-looking technology, and that is current technology. And all of them was technology based on very basic and simple concept of binding energy. Now I come to the cross-section. Andrian also uh, discussed uh, neutronics uh, in terms of cross-section. Just to remind you, and within my logic, you can see if number of neutrons coming to some substance, some of them captured, and you can see that the reaction rate, that is number of reaction per second, per cubic centimeters, of course, uh, is governed by the atomic density of the material, thickness of the materials, and number of neutrons and velocity of neutrons. And this production uh, concentration of neutrons to their velocity is special terms uh, possesses, that is neutron flux. So just to keep up with the dimensions on the left side and the right side, you put one uh, coefficient of proportionality, and this uh, coefficient of proportionality is uh, has a um, <clears throat> measurement units square centimeters. And uh, this, for this reason, uh, it is called a cross section. And since the micromir is governing with the very small units, they introduced the special uh, measurement units, one barn, which is 10 to the minus 24 square centimeter. And typical cross-section, for example, for iron 56, looks like that. You see, the less energy of incident neutrons, the higher the cross-section. And we have three very well uh, distinct uh, areas We this region of neutron energy we call thermal energy or slow neutrons energy, this region, fast neutrons, and you see very complicated behavior of nuclear cross-section, we call resonance area. So very simple. It looks like very complicated, but in fact, uh, I will touch only very basic things. For example, for uranium-235, you can see fission cross-section dominates over the, all the energy region of incident neutrons. For uranium-238, it is not like that. Only in the very high energy of the incident neutrons, fission cross-section dominates over the capture cross -section. That's why the um, so-called critical mass of uranium-235 is rather small, about 50 kil kilograms, and for uranium-238, it is infinity. So you cannot uh, construct any kind of reactor. And by the way, reactor is a facility to maintain so-called chain reactions. Because in each action of the uh, fission, we produce not only fission products, but several neutrons. So that is a very simple concept. And you can see <coughs> that the most important isotope for nuclear power generation is uranium-235. Another point is the number of fission neutrons. You can see that is for those who are very uh, keen about reactor kinetics, I recommend a classical textbook, physics of nuclear kinetics. All the concept of delayed neutrons, all the concept of neutron production and reactivity effects in a very simple English and very nice English language are described in this textbook. I just give you only one uh, figure from that uh, textbook, and that is about number of neutrons produced as a result of fission uh, reaction. You can see that is peak of the uh, neutron energy produced is about one MeV. I put this figure picture in the more simple form just to introduce to you that is about one, um, just a bit less than uh, one mega electron volt, the neutron energy is dominating within this community of fission neutron produced. So one MeV. But if you have a look at the uranium isotopes cross-section, you can see, so, so majority of the neutrons are produced through the fission of uranium-235 in this region. But the point is, the maximum of fission cross-section is in the thermal region. 
And uranium-235 is not going alone in nuclear reactors. It is also accompanied with uranium-238. And uranium-238 has a very huge resonance capture cross-section. So in this very simple form, in the form of metaphor, I show you the basic principle of thermal reactor operation. Important is you have to slow down neutron into thermal region where the maximum cross-section for uranium-235, avoiding a resonance capture of uranium-238. So Red Hat could approach her grandmother through the forest. That is the objective of the reactor physics study, reactor physics design, and reactor operation. And of, co of course, the most uh, evident uh, way how to avoid the resonance capture is just use fuel in the form of fuel element. So if neutron produced as a result of fission reaction within the fuel element, let it escape from the uranium fuel and undergo nuclear reactions of elastic and inelastic cross-section in moderator. And when uh, its uh, energy becomes close to thermal energy, it, return, it returns to the fuel and captured by uranium-235. So very simple, very simple. Heterogeneous arrangement of fuel and moderator, that is a must, in fact. That's why you have fuel pin in any kind of reactor. That is just to avoid resonance of uranium-238. So, and this combination of fuel pins and moderators governs all the technology which exists in nuclear power right now. Look at the uh, moderator uh, substances like hydrogen, uh, heavy hydrogen, deuterium, or uh, that is uh, uh, carbon. You can see that is uh, a level of capture cross-section. For hydrogen, that is just unity. For uh, heavy hydrogen, that is excellent. 10 to the minus 3 bars. For the carbon, it is also excellent, 10 to the minus 2. So that's why all the domain of the reactor types is governed by combination of uranium enrichment and the uh, capture properties of the uh, moderator. Can do react, can do. Can do can work with natural uranium. So it doesn't need uranium enrichment because in can do as a moderator, they use deuterium. RBMK, for example, Chernobyl type reactor. We use in this type of reactor carbon as a moderator. That's why we little bit increase, but not so dramatically, the uranium 235 fraction in the uranium fuel, 1.8. For the water, because of higher capture cross section, for water cooled reactor, boiling or pressurized water reactor, PWR or VVR Russian type, we have enrichment 3.8. Three of even 5%, depending upon uh, optimized uh, from the viewpoint of economic uh, fuel cycle. And that is floating nuclear power plant, so called belonging to domain of small uh, and medium sized reactors. You see, small and medium sized reactors, they are destined to work in the remote places. That's why logistic to move fuel, to bring fuel, and to remove fuel is not so often should be done. So that's why they increase uranium enrichment in this facility, almost up to 20%. And this has come also to the, uh, to the problem. Because if you look at the IEA statute, and with the IEA statute, you can find the Article 3 functions, they clearly stated that to establish an administrative safeguard designed to ensure that special fissionable and other materials, services, equipment, facilities, and information made available by the agency or at its request or under its supervision or control are not used in such a way as to further a military purpose. So that is, by the way, the main role of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. On the one side, to, uh, <clears throat> to seek to accelerate to develop nuclear power for peaceful purposes, and from other side is just to, uh, to, to watch, to
to, to play the role of the watchdog. And what they are discussing, which kind of isotope? You see, special fissionable material, plutonium or uranium-233, enriched uranium isotopes, source materials. Uh, so these kind of materials are getting to be problematic from the viewpoint of organizing so-called safeguards. And if you have a look at the right side of the uh, slide, you can see that is a fresh fuel uranium, for example, 3.3% of enrichment, that is fresh fuel, and that is discharge fuel. And of course, the fraction of uranium-235 becomes less, but also produced plutonium, minor actinides, fission products. And if you have a look at the uh, uh, glossary uh, for the safeguards, you can see a special term, so-called significant quantity. Significant quantity, that is approximate amount of nuclear material for which the possibility of manufacturing a nuclear explosive device cannot be excluded. Significant quantities taken into account unavoidable losses due to conversion manufacturing processes and should not be confused with critical mass. And you see for plutonium, regardless of isotope composition, eight kilograms of plutonium. The only one exemption containing less than 80% of plutonium-238. This kind of plutonium is exemption from safety. Uranium-233, 8 kilo. Highly enriched uranium, 25 kilograms of uranium-235. So you can see also kind of problem. Not a big problem. It should be solved. It can be solved through upgrading the safeguard measures or through the organizing fuel cycle in such a manner that should be uh, uh, proliferation resistant. If we have a look at the minor actinides, you can see, and plutonium, and americium, and curium, they have a critical mass rather small, rather small. But what's important for these isotopes, you see, they accompanied by the uh, decay heat or uh, emission of uh, spontaneous neutrons. And if you have a spontaneous neutron rates half enough, it will be difficult to assemble explosive device. And if you have a rather high uh, decay heat, it's difficult also to manage with the explosive device. So you, you can see that minor actinides and plutonium, they have a naturally inherently possessing uh, protection measures against unsanctioned proliferation of nuclear materials leading to manufacturing of explosive device. So what is the real problem, in fact, for nuclear power when we uh, come to the waste problem? It is fission products. Uranium can be recycled. Plutonium can be recycled. And that is a, a mature technology, recycling uh, in the form of MOX and European reactors. Minor actinides also, they can be recycled. And through neutron capture, they can produce plutonium-238. And you remember, plutonium-238 can work as a protector of plutonium against proliferation. So the only one problem we have for nuclear waste unresolved so far, that is the problem of fission products. Some of them, they have a very long half-life, more than 10,000 years. Not so many of them. Selenium, zirconium, technetium, palladium, so these kind of isotopes. But they are very influential in terms of effect on deep geological storage. This data I taking from the uh, cumulative release estimates from spent fuel in 10,000 years from the Yucca Mountain project in the United States of America. You can see plutonium allowed release and predicted release is rather small. Neptunium, small. Uranium, you see that is allowed and predicted different. So if you put plutonium just underground, you have to think about safeguarding. That's a problematic. If you put plutonium in this fuel cycle, you can use additional energy production. For plutonium. And plutonium itself, it is not just naturally occurred as a group. It is produced from unfissionable, uh, uh, so no, not unfissionable, no, unfissile uranium-238, which fraction in the natural uranium more than 99%. You see, that is the valuable resources, which can open the door open the opportunity and window to, uh, to the resource abundant nuclear future 
uh, in coming century. The only problem, technetium iodine cesium. You see, they can release from the deep geological storage and make a harm effect. So that's why the problem is how to do, how to deal with this isotopes. And of course, you remember, a neutron is not just a particle, it is just a like philosophical stone. It can be used to produce plutonium from uranium, thus giving the uh, unlimited resources for nuclear power. And it also be used, this neutron, to kill fission products, radioactive fission products, to kill them and to produce stable nuclei, free of getting a problem to the humankind. So we need neutrons. And how to produce neutron abundance, how to approach the era of neutron abundance, I will show you also from uh, simple graphs. You see that is neutron coefficient from uranium-235 as a function of incident, nuclear, uh, incident neutron energy. The higher energy, the higher number of neutrons. So that, is, that was behind the idea of fast reactors. We need neutron access to produce either plutonium or to transmute fission products. That's all. And now you can, uh, you can read this kind of uh, spectra. I took it from the generation four systems and the related fuel strategies uh, presentation uh, European Union Rosatom meeting several years ago. And uh, I personally very like this picture because it's not just symbolic, not just a draft, not just picture. It was calculation. And uh, from this uh, picture, I can see that it was ra rather, sorry, it was rather professional. Professional gentleman who draw this kind of graph. Now I would like to pay your attention. Look, for example, pressurized water reactor. You see, that is in a neutron spectrum, they have a peak about one MeV. You remember, neutrons mainly produced with this energy, one MeV. So the first peak is here. Then moderation occurs. And here it is another peak for a pressurized water reactor. Here you can see two peaks. Neutron produced and neutrons where they used in thermal region. So that is pressurized water reactor. That is very high temperature reactor. Also, you see peak in the thermal region. And sodium fast reactor. No peak in the thermal region. Uh, Let uh, fast reactor, green one. No peak in the region. So it means this kind of reactor are destined to produce excess of neutrons. And important also is how neutron uh, produced per act of absorption, not only per fission, but per absorption, fission plus capture. And this is more illustrative number. You can see that is neutron energy. And in the thermal region, the neutron excess is produced by uranium-233. And now you understand why for mm, some of the concepts for uh, uh, molten salt reactors, they use thorium. Because thorium fuel cycle uh, with the flyby, it's easy to tune spectrum into the thermal region, produce uranium-233, which is more effective in this energy domain. But for plutonium, it is much more preferable fast neutrons. That's why current fast reactor technology mainly oriented to MOX fuel. One more slide to give you a sketch of Newton balance in thermal and fast reactors. Now you can see that is pressurized water reactor and the neutron spectra have a two peaks, one MeV and thermal. In fast reactors, you can see only one peak, about one MeV. And you can see neutron generation, even if we assume that number of fission uh, neutrons are produced the same, about 2.9. If we take into account necessary energy generation, neutron consumption that is to maintain chain reaction, capturing fissile, fuel breeding, you can see that there is the lack of neutrons in water moderated reactors. And there is extra neutrons in fast 
And in fact, it was the main idea behind uh, many concepts appeared uh, in 1990s about fast reactors and use them to uh, kill fission products, to avoid deep geological storage at all. And not so many concepts, but look, some of them were developed in uh, Japan, and both myself and Vladimir Kriventsev worked in Tokyo Institute of Technology with these professors. They showed the way to Japan with the lack of uh, free uh, space to organize deep geological st storage. They advocated the potential of fast reactors. Also the same in Europe, Mr. Salvatore, who was a always inviting professor for the uh, Trieste meeting, and I very much appreciate uh, his uh, contribution to neutronics and to the transmutation studies. In fact, he was one of the people who um, participated in my defense of my PhD in Japan. So, and in Russia, we have uh, several classical uh, studies, concept of radiation equivalency. We, in Russia, not so much concentrated about number of nuclides to be transmitted. We selected only technetium and iodide. <clears throat> and uh, Russian nuclear technology, as you know, we are now championing in development of nuclear technology, give you in fast rate technology, give you a sketch. You see, we started as early as in 1960s. In 1973, it was the uh, first commercial uh, fast reactor uh, built in Kazakhstan, former Soviet Republic. And 1980, uh, sodium cooled fast reactor BN600, 2016 BN800. And this is very important. You see, this and this, about 40 years difference, and very symbolic. In Russia, we still keeping the competence to design and to operate with these reactors. Some, some countries, especially in the Western world, they have a problem with the competences because of delayed fast reactor development in recent decades. <clears throat> and these are our achievements in the Russian Federation. You see, last December, BN800 sodium cooled reactor was fully loaded with MOX fuel. So plutonium now circulated in fast reactor to produce another plutonium and uh, to, to avoid the plutonium uh, disposal. And we have also uh, for future uh, <coughs> multifunctional uh, uh, research reactor with a capacity 150 megawatt. And this reactor will also use MOX fuel with plutonium enrichment up to 38%. Uh, uh, Why I'm talking about this one? Because you remember in European taxonomy, they selected fast reactor as an orienteer for European uh, development. But they pointed also the focus that that is on the laboratory scale. Now I'm putting an exclamation mark. In Russia, this technology is not a laboratory technology. It is on the industrial scale. And uh, the latest project, you see ProRIF in Russian breakthrough, the, the way to the future, that is general layout of the first in the world uh, lead cooled fast reactor with the capacity 300 megawatt electrical, 300 megawatt electrical. It belongs to also to the domain of small reactors and current status. You see, now it is under construction. You see the cooling tower also uh, in this kind of image you can see. Commissioning of the fuel fabrication plant and construction of spent nuclear fuel reprocessing and startup of the reactor, uh, new fuel production facility coming 2024, two years later, reactor itself. And after that, 2029, uh, startup of the fuel reprocessing facility. What's important about this concept? You see, fuel cycle should be closed within the perimeter of a single nuclear power plant. Everything connected to fuel fabrication to fuel reprocessing and to electricity production will be within the fence, within the perimeter of nuclear power plant. And this system will consume only depleted uranium and take out from the system several fission products. And you see the general uh, characteristic of this kind of facilities, combination of facilities. No uranium enrichment, no separated plutonium from the viewpoint of non-proliferation as a positive uh, feature. Closing fuel cycle for a single nuclear power plant, 
for um, saving the resources, and the radioactivity of uranium consumed equal to radioactivity disposed in the form of technology. So this kind of concept now under industrialization in Russia. This slide shows you fast react advancement uh, globally. i sorry for some of the uh, concept I didn't include here, um, uh, which are suspended, for example, in Europe. That is the Russian Federation. I mentioned uh, Brest 300, which is under construction. And first commercial reactor, again, I emphasize commercial reactor. Uh, decision to construct this reactor was uh, made uh, last year, December, decision made, and this will be commercially operated. India also in advancing state, China in advancing state, Japan, unfortunately, Monju, we visited Monju with Vladimir several times. So unfortunately, Monju is under decommissioning now, but Joya is suspended and uh, we have a chance with Japanese people who will make a presentation uh, after me uh, to understand what is the uh, current status of the fast reactor development technology in Japan. So, <clears throat> Just I'm finishing. Vladimir, uh, how long uh, should I talk? How many minutes I have? Uh, you, you can take, actually, we, we 15 minutes delay, so you have like 20, 25 minutes more. Okay, I believe. okay. No. So, let, let me check. Uh, Vladimir, yes. that is also my special um, appreciation to your activity, to activity of your section. Because in your section, you started the um, discussion of the synergy between nuclear uh, process and the nuclear fission process and the uh, fusion process. And I would like to show you the potential of fusion technology in terms of transmutation of uh, nuclear waste. But before coming to the details, I just give you what does it mean transmutation? You see that is simple equation. That is uh, a rate of change of specific nuclide. It depends upon yield as a result of fission products, natural decay, and capture times uh, flux, that is transmutation rate. In any case, we can solve this uh, equation where in a very simple form and to, to, to estimate what does it mean equilibrium condition for uh, radioactive nuclei. So, and you, you, we can reach uh, equilibrium either in this way or in that way. We can manage either this small equilibrium uh, mass of nuclides or this one. And we can uh, reach equilibrium with this, this time or with this time. So the characteristics of uh, tra transmutation are equilibrium mass and time to approach equilibrium. And now look at this table. Yes, fast reactors, they can produce extra neutrons but they are limited in flux. Flux is limited. Neutron flux is limited by thermohydraulics. Flux, that is the neutron per square centimeters, or the cubic centimeters per second. It depends upon fission rate, and fission rate gives you a temperature. So that's why uh, thermohydraulics and material sustainability is a limiting factor. So flux, 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 and spectrum. You can see if we take, for example, cesium-135 with the natural half-life about 2 million years, and that is most problematic nuclides in deep geological storage, if we put it in the uh, fast spectrum reactor, yes, we can transmute technetium, but look, equilibrium, uh, time to approach equilibrium will, will be 1,000 years. It's not a simple, it's not an argument to show to future generation that we can solve the problem of waste transmutation. That's why we uh, uh, come and to ask help in the fusion uh, technology. And fusion technology, just to remind you, fusion technology that is deuterium plus tritium produce alpha particles and neutrons, but very high energy neutrons, 14 MeV neutrons. And since there is no tritium in the nature, we have to breed tritium. And Adrian showed you the cross-section of lithium for tritium production. So it works, it works. 
But nevertheless, in order to produce tritium, we need neutron multiplication. So end-to-end -end reaction, you see, one of the neutron we can uh, deliver to produce uh, fuel, and other one can be captured anywhere. So, and you see, that is typical concept of the ether blanket. And why ether? Ether it is a mature technology. It is under construction. And within ether, there are several concepts of blanket. But I just taken one uh, dated 1997, very old one. So it's just a combination of layer of neutron multiply, beryllium, and uh, stainless steel and beryllium zone, that is lithium, zirconium, etc. What's important for uh, ITER? It is a neutron wall blow. So how many neutrons per one square centimeters per second coming through the first wall and go to the blank? And you see, you see that there is neutron wall load and it is about 10 to the 13 neutron per square centimeter per second. So, but if we just put moderator plus fission products in this region, moderator and fission product, we can produce a very favorable for transmutation uh, neutron spectrum. Again, let me give you exercises how to read a neutron spectrum. You see, <clears throat> typical pressurized water reactor. Once again, peak in one MeV and peak in the thermal region. Fast reactors, peak in about one MeV and no, no peak in the thermal region. And the fusion reactor, we have a peak for 14 MeV neutron, which is coming from plasma. But what important, neutron producing zone, it means plasma, is specially very much uh, distant from the, uh, not very much distant, but could be separated from the transmutation zone where these neutrons are to be consumed and used. And we can reach the <coughs> flux in the thermal region even higher than in pressurized water reactor. So within flux typical for fast reactors, coming to the blanket, and possibility to shape neutron spectrum, very favorable. We can reach this kind of <clears throat> situation with transmutation of cesium-135. You can see, instead of uh, fast spectrum with this very high flux, we have uh, five centuries, but with fusion neutron source, we can approach just 22 years, and that is a lifetime of facility. So there is not for future generation. We leave this burden. We can transmute it in city in this time. So this kind of synergy, I very much advocate uh, at the meetings which Vladimir is organizing under the umbrella of the uh, activity synergy between fusion and fusion technology in the agent. And what's important, if we just move from deuterium tritium fusion facility to deuterium deuterium facility, we can reach even more favorable uh, neutron spectrum, this peak in the thermal region, and we can uh, transmute any kind of materials. We are not uh, oriented for power production. That's why deuterium, deuterium plasma with the neutrons about 2.45 MeV instead of deuterium tritium plasma, which produce order of magnitude more higher energy neutrons. Instead of using these neutrons for power production, we can use them very effectively to transmute high radioactive level waste, which is now uh, considered as a bottleneck of uh, global development of nuclear power. That's all my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention, and my pleasure will be to answer your question, if any. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Great talk. And we have enough time for, for discussion, for questions, comments, please, here. If you have any questions. Not yet. From, from the online audience as well. Please raise your hands. Looks like people are tired after lunch. Huh? Please. after lunch. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, no. there is one question. Yeah, there will be more. Don't worry. We will activate. Uh, 
Dr. Balumi, Balumi uh, hello sir, it's a very nice presentation and uh, I have a question about SMR, development of SMR. So you, I think you are the right person to give the answer of my question. My question is that uh, when I study, uh, started a study about nuclear engineering, now I had a PhD degree in nuclear engineering. So I did MTech in nuclear engineering and PhD in nuclear engineering. But I, from my starting of nuclear engineering life, I heard about SMR. But in the last eight years, the SMR development is very, very slow. So what is the reason of this development of SMR is very slow? <coughs> Reason? <clears throat> yes, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> okay. Why? <clears throat> well, there were no clearly defined boundary condition for their development. You see, just several years ago, uh, globally, we found the very strong factor influencing our life on our planet. We have to save our planet within 1.0 degree centigrade and the zero carbon releasing technology is only one mature technology that is a nuclear power technology and with this this technology we have a potential to construct uh, like a conveyor on a very uh, to to move the effect from fissile economy to machinery technology to machinery technology yeah. built quickly on side and to put and deploy it very quickly on a very uh, large scale. We have a potential. Why we didn't make it uh, in a fast manner? That's also not, uh, not completely c correct physics. You see, in the Russian Federation, for example, we have a technology, so-called RITM 200, and uh, we started this technology just recently when we found that for economic development of Russian Federation, we need more icebreakers for the North Sea route. You see, and this uh, small and modular integrated reactor with a capacity about less than 100 megawatt, megawatt thermal, because for icebreakers, we need thermal energy, not exactly electrical energy. And you see 20, uh, 2020, academician Lomonosov put into commercial operation. Next year, that is a floating nuclear power plant based upon ice breaking technology. Next year, the first leading uh, ice breaker, Arctica, it is title of the name of the ice breaker, put into commercial operation. And on board in this ice breaker, they have uh, two small modular reactors. Next year, one more icebreaker. Next year, one more. So now we have eight uh, small modular reactor, rhythm time uh, on board of icebreakers. So it's coming. It depends upon economic objective. We have this kind of objectives for our Northern Sea Route and the humankind, we have a limitation with the CO2. And I think jointly in a peaceful manner, in a in a cooperative mode, we can we can fastly deploy this technology. And after that, we have, by the way, potential to resolve the problem of waste in a certain energetic manner. That's my comment, uh, possible answer. Vladimir, just uh, this okay. small comment also. You think that, like, uh, with this all climate change, probably Russia will not need icebreakers there soon. <laughs> You see, Vladimir, I yes, I completely agree this. with this guy. And that, that is not so, how to say, not new comment I hear. <laughs> because the Russian people who are engaged in this kind of business, they say, we can make another road, <laughs> not from, not from uh, Russia to Asia, but through the North Pole to, to America, <laughs> to, to make economical uh, cooperation. Okay. Say, say, okay, please, the question from audience here. Um, thank you, Dr. Chisuk. Uh, when you said that fast reactors have a limited neutron flux, uh, you were talking just about the, the spectrum or other, other aspects? <coughs> uh, spectrum, that is not the <coughs> primary thing. Flux, flux. 
number of neutrons per square centimeter per second. You see, flux governed by fission generation rate. And fission generation rate, number of fission per second. That is uh, uh, power density in the reactor. And power density is the re reactor is limited by uh, structure of materials and combination coolant and uh, 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 fuel, uh, regardless of the discussion about safety. So materials, they are limiting factor for flux. No spectrum, of course, fission spectrum is limited in itself. So, so, so the number of neutrons with the energy about 10 MeV is negligibly small. The peak is about one MeV. So limitation. Limitation from the viewpoint of reactor physics and limitation from a viewpoint of material science. Flux. Okay, Vladimir, we have a question from chat, which is, I will read it for you just to make mm -hmm. it quick. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Could you give some insight about the ongoing projects about fusion, fission projects around the world? I have read yes. about China's <laughs> effort in this field of research. Yes. <coughs> Vladimir, I have some additional slides. In fact, I anticipated some of this question. Yes, but of, of course, I will not I will not go in, into detail. You see, so so many projects just give you a flavor of nuclear uh, fusion development. This one, first. First, please have a look. That is technology readiness level for fusion is about three level. So we have to reach a uh, <coughs> little bit higher level, little bit higher level. What is the way? How can we reach it? You see, fusion technology viewed with low technology readiness, yes. But small programs are starting in few member states to support the ambitions of private fusion enterprises. So this is a good signal from the market about fusion development. I took these uh, graphs and table from the special seminar organized by Vladimir Krivensov uh, last, last June. You see how many, how many private companies are com coming to this place. And they they focusing not uh, about big facilities, about small facilities. Small are uh, easy to make. If they fail, they will fail quickly, and we don't need to spend 50 years to prove they are useless. You see, dynamic of the uh, fusion technology is astonishing. You see how many countries, how many countries developing a special program. And by the way, number of private companies and startup for SMRs less than fusion companies. That's just general uh, general picture, general layout. Uh, of course, uh, some some very astonishing, very positive uh, achievements are marked in the United Kingdom, one of the leaders, in China, in the United States concerning commercial uh, fuel confinement. That is maybe three uh, leading countries right now, China, UK, and the United States. So many, pro many projects are ongoing there, and uh, I cannot touch each of them. <clears throat> okay, thank you. We have a question from chat also regarding to the sodium from Alessio Luvara. And regarding to the sodium fast reactor, do you think Russia will export BN-1200? <clears throat> Why not? Why not? I have special graph for that. <laughs> Well, yeah. you see, yes, I show you some, some, some numbers. Some numbers. Mm. Uh, first of all, first of all, yes, BN uh, 1200 is the world's first commercial fast vehicle. That is the first most important thesis. Then, you see, <clears throat> there is some characteristic compared to previous BN uh, 600 and BN uh, 800 in terms of specific material capacity. So in terms of volume of uh, materials for reactor building, so it's, uh, it, it, it has a potential for to, to be commercial. And uh, it's um, uh, LCOE, LCOE, this one, you see, it is comparable to the generation three 
reactor, which is under construction right now in the middle of Russia. And you see, we consider so-called double component. Thermal reactors will be decreased in numbers because of <laughs> exhaustibility of uranium-235. Fast reactor because of artificial production of plutonium will be uh, increasing. And we have a sp special option for fast reactor expert. Look at this slide. In 2045. Yes. From Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience here? Oh, Christian, please, please give him the microphone. Thank you, Vladimir, for your good, very good presentation and overview. I have a question about the, uh, you know that uh, we could have uh, both uh, fast reactors why not sodium fast reactors? But also uh, some systems with heavy liquid metals who have maybe a hard spectrum, maybe better for uh, transmutation. Do you think that we have to foresee in the future only one, uh, I would say, single system <coughs> able to uh, use uh, plutonium, uh, depleted uranium, and, uh, and the minor actinides? Or maybe is it better to separate the two targets? Uh, one is uh, reuse of plutonium and depleted uranium, as uh, it was, I would say, the main objective in the past and even now, of course. And uh, another system, which could be a heavy liquid metal or ADS for the transmutation of minor actinides. What is your position? Mm -hmm. What is the strategy in Russian Federation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yes, just a moment. <clears throat> ah, look, uh, currently in Russia, we consider both options. Sodium, that is BN, sodium cooled. And this is BR that is less cooled fast reactor. They have the same capacity, you see. Even they will have the same fuel, that is uranium, plutonium <coughs> mixed, nitrite fuel, very dense fuel. <coughs> Why we develop both technologies? That is critical reactor operation. Why? Because, you see, sodium is not so good, as Vladimir mentioned, from the viewpoint of... Uh, uh, accident uh, mitigation. So that is fire of sodium. That is matter of fact. So, but uh, lead, lead from this viewpoint, it's very nice material. But with sodium, we accumulated a lot of uh, experience, operational experience. So both technology at this moment, they are uh, almost at the same level of appreciation in my country. So what what will be in future, uh, I, I'm not sure. From the viewpoint of reactor physics, from the viewpoint of reactor physics, I am in favor of lead technology. It's very simple, why? It's very simple. Lead consists of 50% of lead isotope uh, with the mass number 208. And lead proton number 82, that is double magic nuclei. Double magic. It means from the viewpoint of neutron economy, it is excellent one. From the viewpoint of shaping neutron spectrum, it is an excellent one. If you have a dense uh, fuel element arrangement, you can reach a very hard neutron spectrum, harder than in sodium. If you uh, remove, move out from each other fuel pins, and uh, more uh, lead coolant uh, fraction uh, you achieve, you can shape uh, neutron spectrum in the thermal region. Unbelievable, but it is. Because though uh, lead is very heavy nuclide, since it doesn't capture neutrons, through elastic scattering, you can shape very uh, thermal spectrum. So from my viewpoint as a physicist, I'm in favor of that. As for the... Uh, uh, accelerator-driven system or critical reactor operation. I'm sorry, I don't see, 
I don't see major difference. Because if you have accelerator driven system, that is just extra external neutral. And if you have a blanket uh, consisting of minor recognized plutonium, whatever you like, uh, the transmutation rate will be again be limited by the material sustainability, material science. Because flux in the blanket will be governed not by beam, but by fission rate. So from this viewpoint, again, let me summarize and wrap up. I'm in favor of LED technology. Uh, technology, uh, LED technology is considered one of the options uh, along with sodium technology in Russia. As for uh, accelerated driven or critical reactor operation, I personally don't see much difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Let's, let's accept last question from online audience. And this from India, I believe, or Ksishti uh, Asit Acharya. Sorry for permission. Yes, sir. No, that's fine. Am I audible? Yes, please. Yeah, good evening, sir. So, I mean, based on uh, the last two answers that you gave, uh, I would like to understand, I mean, the, the minor actinides are also nowadays used and researched for tertiary nitride and carbide fuels, wherein uranium, plutonium, <coughs> americium, carbide, or nitride fuels. So first of all, what is the status of these fuels uh, as, as using them in the reactors? Number two, how the reactor physics changes when such uh, a tertiary or a binary uh, system comes into play as a fuel? Uh, mm -hmm. So if you can throw some light into it. I can answer only the first question. <clears throat> about uh, nitrate fuel, about uh, carbide fuel, I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't have enough information. About <clears throat> nitrate fuel with uh, uh, minor actinides doping, we have now uh, experimental study in the Russian uh, experimental fast reactor board. So we are experimenting with that. With uranium doped fuel, we are experimenting in terms of developing this double uh, component nuclear power system with the transmutation of my nitrogenides. That's all. As for physics, you, you understand from the viewpoint of physics, my nitrogenides will give some, uh, some, some, some problem from the viewpoint of reactivity coefficient. But of course, it, it, can, be, it can be solved from the particular arrangement. I don't see any problems here. No, that's general answer. Sorry okay. for generality. Again, Vladimir, thank you very much for your great lecture. And now we go for the coffee break.